<laughs> well, I want to welcome everyone to the fifth webinar for Start Smart Webinars by Flat6 Labs. Today we have uh, Roxanne Varza from the director of Station F based in Paris and Phaeton, our marketing and outreach manager from Flat6 Labs Tunis. And um, today they're going to be talking about opportunities and lessons learned. Um, just to go over the agenda, we'll have about 30 minutes uh, of the interview and uh, everyone is welcome to submit their questions through, through Zoom or on the YouTube comments section. And we'll be taking questions from everyone in the last uh, 20 minutes. I'll leave the floor to Phaeton now and uh, for both of them to also introduce themselves. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so I'm Feta Naisi, Marketing and Outreach Manager from Flat6 Labs Tunis, and I really welcome you, Roxanne. Thank you again for being part of this event. Uh, you have been on my list for quite some time. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you for accepting the invitation. Um, so you started your career in Business France. Uh, you founded uh, Tech Baguette. Uh, which turned 10 years now. So Tech Baguette, for uh, those who don't know, it's, so it's, uh, it's um, a startup or tech-focused uh, blog that uh, Roxanne uh, started a few years ago. And then Tech Baguette kind of opened the doors to Tech Crunch. Uh, so you have been editor-in-chief of Tech Crunch France. And then you led uh, Microsoft Ventures. Uh, right in Paris, and then between all of that, you co-founded uh, Starter. Uh, you co-founded also TechEU, and uh, you brought Falcon to France. So um, after that, you are so now you are director of Station F, and uh, Station F is the biggest campus startup campus in the world. Can you talk us? Can you tell us about it a little bit? Yeah, super. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for the invitation. It's great to be here. Um, Station F. Uh, yeah, so the, the intro is, a, <laughs> is I always love to hear people talking about tech baguette. It was actually, it started out as kind of a joke. Um, I just wanted to make a blog and my dad was like, oh my God, please don't, please don't call it tech baguette. It will never work. And just as you said, it actually ended up opening quite a lot of doors. Um, throughout my career. And so the most recent project uh, that I've been involved with for actually will be five years in October, I can't believe it's gone by so fast, is Station F, uh, the world's biggest startup campus. So I joined in 2015 when uh, the site was uh, one year into construction. The, it's essentially an old freight station, 34,000 square meters that we turned into this wonderful startup space. Um, people often confuse it. They call it a, a co-working, the biggest co-working. They call it the biggest incubator. We actually have 30 different startup programs on campus and a number of other different services, which is really why we refer to it as a campus and not an incubator. We have a massive maker space with different equipment for making prototypes, an investor community that comes on site. Uh, we have a space for public services. We have some like mini offices for Google and Apple and Amazon and a lot of companies that a lot of startups work with. A huge restaurant that takes up literally a third of our building. We love food and it's not to be ignored in, in building relationships. And finally, most recently last summer, we opened housing for wow. 600 people who work on campus to live nearby. So really when we're talking about a campus, you should think of it as like a university campus, but for startups. Yeah, but you you also had this capacity to um, to uh, to build this strong community. Um, I'm referring to the letter that you have written for Station F community. Um, so, how what are the ingredients that you really uh, used to build such um, such ties with such a big number of people? I think you are hosting about a thousand startups or something like that, plus the VCs, yeah. all of the other, all of the other components of the campus. So how do you build a strong community? Yeah, so um, our community is 1000 startups, but as you mentioned, we have a whole bunch of other players that are involved in our community, VCs. Actually today our VC community is probably around a hundred funds. 
Um, we have, you know, our 30 different partners that run our programs. We have, uh, you know, 30 different public services that are involved with the French tech. So when we're talking about our community, we're talking more close to 5,000 people, maybe a little bit more. And obviously these people, they're coming and joining the community and leading the community as their startups come and go as well. So it's a continually evolving community. Um, uh, I think actually a lot of the community, it's been amazing to see has in many ways been very organic. And I think when you build a community, you have to leave space for the community to kind of form itself. And um, you pretty much put in place some basic guidelines, you know, treat each other respectfully. And we believe in this and that. But in the, in the big scheme of things, we actually leave a lot of space for the community to tell us what they want and to, to drive themselves. And so this letter that I published actually is something that kind of was inspired by our community itself. It's the first time I ever wrote a letter to our community in the two and a half, almost three years that we've been open. Um, and it's because with the coronavirus uh, crisis, I actually saw something really remarkable in our community. It was in the first hours after we announced that we're closing station F and people are scrambling to figure out, you know, what does it mean for my company? What does it, what does it mean for me and my life? And, you know, where do I go? What do I do? Actually, our, our community really came together and we use one massive Slack uh, for everybody to communicate. So imagine 5,000 people on Slack, it's crazy. Um, and so we actually saw people, you know, all offering different types of help and service. Oh, I can show you how to do this. Oh, want to use my tool for free? Like, here it is. Um, do you want me to ask so-and-so if they can help with something? So really just like the community was like really coming forward and helping each other. And so this letter that I wrote is essentially saying we cannot afford to, um, to not capitalize on that and not continue it. It's not just because we're in crisis that we should behave like that, but we should behave like that all the time. And we should expect people to behave like that all the time. Um, and then with Station Knife, we wanted to push it even further and say that we believe this crisis is an opportunity for us to really um, set uh, kind of a precedent for the ecosystem and for entrepreneurs, which is why by the end of this year, we want every entrepreneur that comes to Station F to be somehow showing us how they respect diversity and sustainability. So that's really what the letter is about. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty impressive also the Milton Park that is Station F because you are able to attract startups from all around the world. Like, how, what are the tools that you use to, to reach out to these startups? Um, the first tool that we use is English, <laughs> which is, I say it because actually it's a big, uh, it causes a lot of uh, craziness in France, you know, I think um, maybe less in the startup ecosystem where everybody kind of speaks English, but we're a very visible entity in France and people expect us to speak French and even legally we're kind of required to speak French, but we kind of made the decision to change our name. Uh, Station F is actually a historical monument, has a great history. You know, we obviously respect immensely the person who built the building, but we couldn't afford to keep the name of the original building. No foreigner would be able to pronounce it. So it was initially called La Alfresine and we've changed our name to Station F. We made the choice to communicate in English. Um, we made the choice also, you know, we bet on a lot of international startups and partners. And when we were picking people to work with us at Station F from the very beginning, we said, you know, we want everybody involved in Station F to have a startup's first mentality. So really you're not here for your own commercial gain, but how are you gonna support startups? And the second thing that we asked them, well, what, what are you gonna do to make this international? Do you have an international network? Do you have some kind of international resources? Um, because we thought that tomorrow's companies are all international companies. And so we really have to support them in that way. So it's, it's kind of, uh, think big. It's kind of, you need to project yourself in, the, in other markets and try to adapt your product to be implementable to other markets rather than think about um, like kind of operate locally. But at the same time, um, we also hear a lot of people saying you better go big in your own country or in, in your own market rather than go big elsewhere and take the risk uh, to fail. What do you think about that? I really think it depends on the project. I mean, I don't think there's a one size fits all. 
Um, we have seen startups that have addressed their local market really, really well, and it's caused them a lot of success. We've seen other projects um, that don't make sense to limit yourself just to your international market. I think a trend that we're starting to see a lot more over the last few years is people are launching simultaneously in their home market country, and they're making an English language version of their product available. And because a lot of you know, startups today are providing remote solutions and what have you, it works pretty well. Otherwise, they're launching multiple cities, multiple countries. It really depends. Um, but I think people are actually now aware that there is a, a greater opportunity to be addressed than just your home market. Yeah. So actually, this uh, this is a good transition for for uh, for our uh, main uh, topic for today: the opportunities that COVID nineteen can um, provide to the startups. So we have been seeing that a lot of startups um, adapted their um, either their market, their um, their product or services to the uh, um, to the uh, to the pandemic, to the circumstances that the pandemic. Um, uh, forced us to uh, to uh, to live in. Um, I, I would I would ask you about first what are or who are the startups that amazed you the most in Station F by uh, by being um, uh, by adapting to the circumstances to the to the uh, right now now circumstances. And then second of all, um, how innovation tackled some of the severe or the most severe aspects of the quarantine? I mean, we have seen startups that provided a lot of um, opportunities in, in entertainment, in health, in education, in, uh, in remote work. Um, so tell us about the startups in Station F that amazed you the most during this period. Yeah, so I think um, you've kind of touched on the topics that have really started to flourish with the crisis. Um, obviously, people in quarantine or are working at home, uh, they're using a lot of remote working solutions. Uh, we've seen obviously everything that addresses medical needs, um, whether it be, you know, like video uh, doctors meetings or different types of way to communicate with healthcare professionals. Um, everybody has been taking to different forms of e-commerce. So anything in e-commerce, logistics, delivery uh, has done really well. Uh, obviously uh, entertainment, gaming has also done really well. Anything that can be streamed. Um, so these are some of the areas that we've seen do really, really well. And then obviously areas that are struggling more would have to do with tourism, with events, and even with um, kind of micro mobility, because a lot of people at the moment are not simply not moving. Um, and I think some of these opportunities are, uh, there are going to be more opportunities presented with the deconfinement period, because we're not going to go back to quote unquote normal life right away. Um, but we've seen obviously a lot of startups kind of take advantage of the fact that people are working remotely and what have you. Um, so startups that have amazed me at Station F, they've actually, we've seen two sets of startups. We've seen startups that obviously their business is super impacted. Um, and so they don't know what to do. And this is a negative impact. So tourism and events and they, they you know, they, what, do, what do they do? Do they just wait for the economy to get better? Um, do they cut everything? Do they shut down? So, you know, some very difficult questions. And then on the flip side, we've had businesses that their business has just taken off. And so they're scrambling. What can they do? How can they hire? <laughs> you know, how, how can they handle the demand that they have? Um, and so I actually have been impressed by cases in both situations because at Station F, we're working with very young, agile companies. And it's been amazing for me to see they've really leveraged their agility to take advantage. Um, so for example, in the case of startups impacted by, in, in a negative way, we had a company that they normally do team building activities um, mm -hmm. for corporations. Well, nobody's doing team bu building right now. You can't do events in France over 10 people, so there's nothing happening. They've actually developed a remote team building offer. So mm -hmm. all the companies that are gonna be struggling in the upcoming months, well, now they have a remote offer potentially available for them. Um, there was another company that uh, they were telling me they had developed a solution for people who didn't want to queue in a restaurant. You know, you go to a restaurant, you order a dish and you want to pick it up and go have lunch. Um, well, they, now the restaurants are closed. There's nobody queuing. So what do they do? Well, actually, they're adapting their solution to, you know, when we come out of confinement, 
people are going to, you know, start opening restaurants? What is the wait going to look like? How are restaurants going to manage that? So we've had a lot of companies adapting their solutions to the current situation. Um, and then I think you asked me what's kind of impressed me the most. Well, actually, it's not necessarily a startup but there have been a lot of movements in France, kind of like grassroots movements from the entrepreneur community uh, to protect local businesses, uh, to help medical professionals get the equipment they need. And a lot of this has come from people and tools in the startup community. So I think those initiatives are the ones that have really kind of impressed me the most. Yeah, we, we've seen that also in our portfolio in Tunis. Um, we had a couple of startups that really adapted their offer um, because of COVID-19. We have, for example, Trust IT that actually initiated an initiative called Sherek. Uh, so what they did is that they are um, trying to uh, collect um, um, laptops, tablets, smartphones, and give them to students from unprivileged um, rural uh, cities to be able to continue their online education. Uh, we have also some, an, another startup in the culture and entertainment, which is Artify, that adapted to the current um, to the current situation, and they are now uh, live streaming all the. Uh, uh, the soap operas in uh, if, because it's the only uh, month of Ramadan, so we have a lot of soap operas mm -hmm. in their platform. They also um, um, helped a festival uh, to um, to showcase their their films in their um, in their platform. We also had a lot of startups that this situation was a good um, a good uh, had a good turnout in their business, and they are also adapting, as you said. It's it's uh, the the demand increased like uh, in in a very short amount of time and they were not prepared for it, um, and you can see then that they are adapting uh, quite uh, quite quickly and that what amazes me the most in startups is the capacity to adapt to the situation to the given situation either it's good or bad, they also um, they always have a response to it, um, and I I also was curious about what the VCs are thinking about this period. Is it a good period to invest? Because this is a question that have been asked a lot. Um, a lot of people ask us, can you ask Roxanne, is it a good time to start a startup? Because you know it's a crisis, so VCs are not going to invest. Is it a good time to invest in startups right now? Um, so the answer, I think, is yes. And I think a lot of VCs have gone out of their way to say we're still open for business. I can uh, maybe count the number of articles that I've seen from different funds on the topic. When you talk to the VCs, obviously, in the immediate uh, first weeks, they're really concentrated on their portfolio companies. So that means that their energy is obviously going to, to the crisis and handling of the crisis for these companies. It doesn't mean they won't look at you know, incoming deals and take advantage of a great investment opportunity. So there are great investment opportunities. Now, I think VC behavior is definitely going to change. I think VCs are probably going to be um, a little bit more demanding, hesitant uh, to make those investments. So that means you might have to go through more meetings in the first uh, situation. I think they're, they're probably going to be paying more attention to uh, cash runway than they were before, uh, maybe concentrating a little bit less, less on growth. And obviously, I think, especially in the first few months, they're going to be looking for recession-proof businesses. So if you're a business that's been booming uh, during you know, this, this confinement period, and uh, we're not expecting a lot of consumer behaviors to change in the next few months, um, so people will continue to buy online. A lot of people are moving towards uh, work from home models. I mean, we have companies even saying they will get rid of their entire office altogether. Um, so we might see some of these big changes in the long term. Now, those might be really great investments uh, to, to, for, for the different funds that are still investing. And then obviously the funds that you probably want to approach and put most of your energy on are funds that have recently closed um, new or have new fresh capital to invest. So a lot of funds in Europe, some of the big names, um, Index, and I think Index actually even announced a, a fund in March. Um, Partech just announced a new fund. So we have quite a, a lot of capital there, but you don't want to go after a fund potentially that hasn't announced new funds uh, recently to invest. 
Yeah, and and also we have been also able to see that there is this new wave of people who are more and more interested as business angels um, to invest in startups rather than VCs. So they are willing to take the risk, uh, even if they are like small tickets, but they feel like they are kind of helping um, the ecosystem by providing um, little amount of money uh, to help the startups survive. Um, in Tunisia, in Plastic Labs Tunis, we, um, we started a program called Investor Academies. It's the kind of awareness program how to invest in innovation rather than in real estate. Um, I know that you have been approaching a lot of, uh, let's say, high profile people or high net worth people to, be, um, to invest in some of your startups. What are the criteria that you look for into, um, into a business angel? Not a startup now, but from the other side. So when a startup wants to approach a business angel, what should they look at? Yes. Um, so I think we have a, a lot of different profiles, obviously in France. And I think um, when it comes to business angels, people really tend to want somebody who has a certain credibility, um, a certain, you know, smart money. Um, and so I think that just going after capital for going after capital is obviously something we discourage. Uh, so there are business investors that they're retired people, they just want to invest because uh, they don't want to pay tax or what have you. We really like people to go after a good fit. And I think we're seeing more and more people. I mean, obviously, if you're a very high net worth individual, you've probably already been investing, you probably have a family office, something like that. Now, what we still have not developed as much in France, and I think there's a huge opportunity for it, um, is people who are pretty comfortable in terms of, you know, maybe they're um, well-paid position in a big company. They, they're very interested in technology. They're in touch with a lot of startups and potential resources that could help develop these businesses. So that's really something that I think is undervalued today. And we have some smaller business angel clubs that are developing uh, to provide that education. But I think you really want to see that the person understands your business and can contribute something other than capital to your business. Otherwise, capital is capital. So you should find something uh, more worth your time. Yeah, because you can find money anywhere, exactly. but you really, a business angel can be like a kind of partner too, because they can open a lot of doors for the startups that they are funding. They network, their, their expertise too. It's, it's very important to have someone that can share a lot of things with you and can give you shortcuts uh, to your, uh, to your uh, business. Um, actually, we had, um, we had um, some of, um, of the entrepreneurs asking about, um, about Station F and how you, are, how you are recruiting startups and what kind, what profile of startups are you, you are recruiting. And also, um, are there any programs um, that are open to entrepreneurs from the MENA region? Of course. So we have 30 different programs at Station F. Um, they all recruit at different times in the year. And all the recruitment for each program is done individually. So my team runs two programs, the Founders Program for Early Stage Companies, all sectors, all geographies and the fighters program, which is for underprivileged entrepreneurs. Um, I can go into the details about the founders program selection because I think that's probably a selection method uh, that's used pretty widely for other programs on campus. Um, but what people should know is that every single program at Station F accepts entrepreneurs from every location. So if you wanna join the Facebook program, the Microsoft program, uh, Entrepreneur First, you can apply to all of these programs. They all accept people from everywhere in the world. Um, and today Station F is one third international in our community and 600 people who don't speak French. So you also don't need to speak French to come in and live and work at Station F. Um, so now going into how we pick companies for the founders program. So we pick two times per year. So people can join the program in January or in July. Um, you have to fill out an online application. So the entire applications process is actually um, done at distance. You don't actually have to come to Paris for an interview or anything like that. Um, the applications form, we ask to see a full-time team. So you're not doing this as a side project. We ask to see a working prototype. Um, so it's not in the idea stage, you've actually developed something. And we're looking to see 
some metrics, some users, hopefully some customers. Um, and actually, we also want to see that you've made fast progress. So we're not looking for somebody who's taken like five years to start a prototype, unless you know there's a specific reason for that. Um, once we have that information, my team goes through the original application. And we usually have maybe 50% um, or less of startups that will make it to round two. Round two is a filmed interview. And you have uh, questions that show up on your screen. It's recorded, you're timed. So you really have to you know, be very quick and concise in your answers. And then once we have the written application and the video, we send it to a network of over 100 entrepreneurs that are part of our selection board. And these are people who founded companies like Zendesk and Product Hunt and SoundCloud, and they're very credible people. And they actually are the ones that review the application. So we like to have, uh, we have this kind of saying that Station F is for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs. And also when it comes to selecting startups, we respect that same philosophy. Oh, nice. And do you have, um, do you have any specific programs for women entrepreneurs? So women entrepreneurs, actually, we are working with all of the programs on campus to raise the number of women in their programs. So when we started Station F the first year, we had one program, the Founders Program, that had 40% of the founders that were women, but all the other programs uh, much lower. After two years, we have five programs that are over 40%. So this is actually very high. And so we're hoping that one day we'll get to 30 programs, 50%. Um, but one initiative that we've launched on campus specifically to support female founders is called the Female Founders Fellowship. We take 10 women or 10 female founded companies rather, and um, they're from all the different programs. And these are just women that we're going to be really pushing to the press uh, to really heighten their visibility. And we're also working with these women so that they will give back to future generations of female entrepreneurs as well. Yeah, so it's 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 more or less kind of uh, um, uh, the same criteria that we are we are looking uh, into into entrepreneurs. And by the way, we have one of our startups uh, on board. Shout out to you guys, uh, which is which got accepted on the focus, focus into industry four o zero, which is led by um, uh, Acceleration in Station F. Um, and it's 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 something that really triggers a lot of curiosity. Um, if I am accepted, should I move to France? Should I stay in my country and have a virtual acceleration or a, like um, attend a virtual program? So how how does it how does it go? Like how does it feel like? Or uh, how is what is the program looks like after the um, the startups are accepted in the program? So startups are usually accepted. I think they get their official acceptance one month before the program kicks off. So it's actually a very tight time. Um, for international entrepreneurs that are accepted, we provide the visa letter and we try to facilitate the visa process as well. So we work really closely with the French government. Obviously it's the French government that makes the final call on the visa. So we don't get a say in that. Um, but usually our entrepreneurs manage to get the visa. We have housing at Station F. So usually the foreign entrepreneurs can also tell us, you know, I want an apartment, I need help. They can come for the beginning of their program and find another place if they prefer. Um, so we try to also facilitate that. And then we have a number of uh, partners and resources that can, you know, really help people get set up when they first come to Paris. But really, I think the, the part that's the most exciting for me about joining the program is the first day. Uh, okay. so onboarding, and that's also the part that I personally like the most in, in working at Station F is when we receive a new batch of startups and what we do is we do a kickoff so we're presenting Station F all the resources and in the beginning we have all the companies in the room present where they come from what their idea is and their team and you you just get blown away by these amazing people from such different backgrounds and locations and these crazy ideas and I just get overwhelmed every time. I'm like, this is where I do this job. <laughs> I can imagine. And, yeah. and yeah, like I can imagine that this is something that really, really uh, is important, even for our personal fulfillment to see how we can impact uh, people's lives. But I, I would also say that the French government is really supportive of the, uh, of the, uh, the startup ecosystem. And especially now we saw that they have um, they have 4 billion euros, if I'm not wrong, um, to support uh, the, the startup ecosystem because of the COVID-19. Um, my question for you would be, 
if you would have the opportunity to manage a kind of station F, but in an emerging market, um, knowing that um, you know you won't have the support uh, that you have now from the French government, how would you approach that? What would you do differently? Um, what would be also afterwards, what would be also your advice for people who are in this situation right now in emerging countries? It's a, it's a really good question. And we get approached by a lot of people who want to launch Station F in their country. Um, so I have two responses to that. I think number one is not to forget how much the French ecosystem has changed over the last 10 years. So I left the US about 10 years ago. When I moved to France, people are like, oh my God, you're crazy. You know, if you like startups and you come from Palo Alto, just stay there, don't go to France, nothing is happening there. And over the last 10 years, we've really seen things change. And, um, you know, the ecosystem even two years ago is not what it is today. So I think it's been a collective effort. It's been the government. It's also been our entrepreneurs. Um, it's also been other, you know, international political, geopolitical, issues, you know, we have Trump who's, you know, not particularly um, pro-immigration. And so a lot of foreign entrepreneurs are no longer going there. Um, Silicon Valley, all of a sudden prices skyrocketed. We have Brexit. So people are not going to traditional ecosystems. A lot of people turned to France and a lot of people also um, felt that Macron uh, had a very pro-business image. So a lot of things really came together at the same time. So I think we should kind of keep that in mind. Now, when we started to think about Station F, when I first joined the team, we had a, a, a big building. We knew we wanted to put 1,000 startups inside, and that's literally all that we knew. That, that's all Xavier told me he wants to do. And so for the first two to three months um, that I was in this job, I was by myself, and I would just go meet with everybody in the ecosystem, startups, big corporations, politicians, journalists, you know, you name it. And I'd say, you know, what are things that you think are working well? What can we do differently? What can we do better in our ecosystem? And you start to hear some, you know, fun ideas, some crazy ideas, but you also start to hear things that people start repeating. So, you know, I, I often tell people the story, but people pitched me the idea of having a startup spa and they were like, people will go into spa and they will network. Um, we, they used to have this idea for, you know, like a Google bus, like they have in Silicon Valley that will take entrepreneurs from Gare du Nord to Station F. Um, but actually I started to hear other ideas that really repeated. I think one idea that came about a lot uh, was having, you know, public services very accessible. And so what we're doing today with La French Tech and the 30 public services is really trying to provide that accessibility. Mm -hmm. um, so all the ideas that started to repeat are actually ones that we ended up keeping. And now it's also necessary to realize that obviously these are going to be different in every ecosystem. So if you want to launch this in, I don't know what country, and we've had people obviously wanting to launch it in Tunisia. I think there is a plan to launch one in Tunisia. Um, but you know, any market that you're in, I tell everybody, look at what the needs of the local entrepreneurs are because they're different everywhere. And also to remember that these needs are totally going to evolve and evolve very quickly over time. So we saw that housing became an issue very quickly. We launched housing, um, which was not actually part of the original plan. And a lot of the projects that we have today, we're just adapting with the feedback that we get. So yeah, it, I think it's um, it's not possible to just replicate the uh, the um, the model of Station F to uh, to the current to to every uh, to any ecosystem that you are in. Uh, I think we're gonna start taking some questions. Um, so one question would be, why would startup build their startup in France rather than San Francisco, London, or Berlin? Um, so that's a super question that we actually get uh, a lot. And so I think obviously it really comes down to the startup, uh, what their needs are. But I think some of the resources that we have in France that are not to be overlooked, uh, we have really great access to early stage funding. So today, BPI France um, is actually the most active investor in Europe. So even ahead of like all the top funds, they're investors in literally everything. So access to early stage capital, France is the leading market. We have excellent engineering talent. So engineers, um, even in Silicon Valley are often French and I think probably much more expensive elsewhere than in France. And finally, I think uh, today, all of the infrastructure, all the resources that you need to build a company are really widely available and accessible. And this is where I think also Station F hopefully contributes uh, quite a bit. Great. 
um, we're going to take another question. How can Middle East ecosystem take advantage of the Station F platform? Um, how, sorry, I have someone crying. <laughs> I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Okay, so how can Middle East ecosystems take advantage of the Station F platform? Um, <laughs> sorry. So uh, how do startups take advantage of Station F platform? I think obviously we are catering to startups that are applying to Station F and joining one of our different programs. Um, and so today it's actually not particularly accessible to startups that are not working with us. Um, but we have a number of events, a number of resources that we're also providing to startups um, you know, that, are, that just wanna come and take advantage of that as well. Um, so we have also a question um, on top of attracting entrepreneurs from the MENA region to Station F. Would you like to take two minutes? I, I need you to repeat the question again. Uh, would you like to take two minutes and then we go back yes. to the question? Please, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So we are, don't, don't hesitate guys to, um, to send us over your questions while our, our guest will be back. Um, so we have a lot of people from Tunisia, from all across the country and all across the world too. Thank you for attending guys. So we're back with Roxanne. Um, the question, the next question is on top of attracting entrepreneurs from the Re MENA region to Station F, would something like Station F campus style physical space work in the MENA region? As in what needs to be present to make something like that possible and successful? And this is Robin Wouters who asked the question. Ah, hey Robin. Um, so I think it's a really good question. Um, and actually what I tell a lot of the people that contact us and wanna do a similar project is that Paris has one element that um, I find is not necessarily present in a lot of other locations and what really caters to making Station F a success. And that is the fact that it is a leading tourist and travel destination. Um, so Station F, people want to come and live there, work there. It naturally attracts people from around the world. So we don't have to go out of our way to attract people to, to, to Paris at least. Um, and then when you're at Station F, we also have regularly people that are coming through. So we've received tons of you know, presidents and politicians and CEOs and investors from around the world, but these are just people that they're already coming to Paris anyway. So I think if you're in a really remote location um, that isn't naturally attracting people, it, uh, it may not give the same results. Yeah, because you need to adapt, as you said earlier, you need to listen to your own ecosystem, uh, ecosystem and adapt to the needs of your, of your ecosystem. Um, so another question, an interesting one. What are some of the major mistakes Station F, Station F has made in working with startups, investors and or corporates in developing its program and the French ecosystem as a whole? The mistakes that we've made, um, we've made a lot. <laughs> I think um, probably I can talk about three that really stick out in my mind. So I think um, when we first opened the Station F building, we actually completely forgot about customer service. And it's just because I think if you go to any small startup space, you don't need customer service because when you have 10 companies, you, you know everybody, they need something, they come and talk to the staff. But because Station F was such a massive location, we had automated so many things, people could come and go freely with badges. We just assumed people would figure out a lot of stuff, but actually we ended up having to really, really reinforce customer service after we opened. So the first few weeks, I think were a hell for the team and for the people working at Station F. Um, so that's number one. Number two is we actually launched a flexible offer initially that we ended up cutting because it didn't actually work the way that we intended it to. So we had initially launched the fellowship, which gave people access to Station F for five days. And this was actually designed initially for entrepreneurs that were not based in Paris, that they would just come to Paris, maybe want to be there for five days. Um, and that was it. 
and we thought these are probably going to be established businesses, you know, and people not really wanting more resources, just really a place to work and some people to, you know, mingle with. So that was how it was designed. And what actually ended up happening was that all of the startups that were not accepted to a program would get a fellowship so that they could somehow access Station F. They would come, but actually these are companies that are potentially much more early stage than companies could work with in the programs. And so they needed a lot more support, which they didn't have in the offer. And it ended up really uh, not working very well and creating a lot of frustration. So we cut it because we didn't have the bandwidth to cater to that. Um, and so that's probably an offer that we're not going to relaunch because we now realize that, you know, if you're coming to Station F, it makes more time for your company at least to be there full time. Um, so these are these are two things. And then the third one is actually our VC community that we have recently readapted. Um, Initially, this was a community of, uh, we wanted to do a limited number of funds. We had a dedicated zone for them on site. Uh, they would come and we were imagining they would come and work at Station F, but actually we realized VCs, all they want is deal flow and meetings. <laughs> so we've completely redesigned our offer. Um, we work with a lot more funds today. So a hundred different funds currently and we're expanding this community. Um, very quickly. And actually what we do is we just provide qualified intros. Whenever we have uh, startups that we feel are relevant for the different funds, we provide intros to funds that are in our, in our community. So that's, that's essentially it. Okay. Those are three of our big mistakes, but we've made a ton more. <laughs> you need to make mistakes to learn. If you don't make mistakes, you're not doing anything interesting, I think. So it's, it's good to, to make mistakes. So talking about your relationship with startups, so someone asked us, do you keep in touch with startups that exited one of Station F programs? Yes, um, so actually we have a beta test version today of an alumni community uh, that we've launched and we're planning on launching this campus wide. We want to maintain our relationships with the startups that leave because obviously we're here to help them get started, but we want to see them grow. We want to see them succeed and we want to be able to follow that um, experience with them. So that's something that we're looking at um, expanding to the entire company today. And then just on a personal level, I try to stay in touch with, you know, if I meet any entrepreneurs, my door is open. You can always contact me, but I think we really want to build a formal uh, alumni program for them. Um, so Nora ask, is asking, um, could you please clarify the meaning of fighter in the fighters program? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, and actually, we don't clarify what it means because we like people to self-identify as a fighter. So a fighter is somebody who has come from an underprivileged background, a difficult background. Um, but we don't think that we can imagine all the different scenarios. So that's why we don't actually define it. We give examples of what it could be. It could be somebody who hasn't had access to higher education, could be somebody who's a refugee, could be somebody um, who's lived a very difficult situation. And to give you examples of two people that we've had in the fighters program, we've had somebody who's been formerly homeless and somebody who's been a former prisoner um, come to Station F and launch companies in the fighters program. But we would have never imagined those scenarios. So I'm very happy that we didn't define them. <laughs> That's impressive, actually. This is really yeah. impressive. And they are very impressive as well. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so another question, is it a good time to start a business, especially when a lot of startups are downsizing and you have wrote a very good um, blog post and medium about downsizing. Um, so um, as an example, Karim um, just laid off 530 um, uh, people uh, because of COVID-19 and they have been like since six months um, laying off about a total of 700 people. So what do you think about this? Is it really a good time to start a business with these, with these, like with this uh, situation, with, with what we are seeing right now, people are struggling to pay their employees and they yeah. are, they're laying off, yeah. So I think it's a super question. Um, I wrote a paper on downsizing and I also wrote a paper on why now is a good time to start a business. Yeah. <laughs> um, Yes, I truly believe that in every um, crisis is opportunity. And we've seen a lot of great companies get founded and funded right after a big economic crisis. So probably the last you know, crisis that we had gave rise to the Airbnbs and Ubers and stuff that we're seeing today. Um, 
I think that there's a number of things to keep into play. Actually, uh, downsizing at other companies means that you have available talent, potentially high qualified talent, because they're not people who are being let go of because of their ability, but they're being let go of because of the economic situation of the company. So I think you should not um, hesitate to take advantage of that. I think also with the, the different behavioral changes that we're seeing, there are obviously um, some opportunities to take advantage of. We talked earlier about you know, remote working solutions, healthcare, uh, things that would support the health industry, uh, you know, online entertainment, and uh, you know, people are going towards e-commerce and different, um, different types of delivery solutions. So there's tons of you know, new things to build and to make. Mark Andreessen also wrote a great post on this that I'm sure everybody has already seen. Um, so now is a really great time. And I also think one additional thing that probably a lot of companies um, underestimate the value of is the fact that right now, because of coronavirus, there's tons of tools and offers and discounts and things that are made available for mm -hmm. free. That is a huge plus that normally we don't have in, in other economic downturns. I haven't seen that. Um, you can go and build something amazing now for almost nothing with incredible people that have been laid off. Uh, so I think you should, you know, not not hesitate to take advantage of that. And also because people are working remotely, you don't have to tap into the local talent that's been laid off. You can contact people that have been laid off in other ecosystems. So I'm specifically talking about all those Americans in yes. Silicon Valley. Go get them, guys. <laughs> you know. Uh, what would be your advice for um, for entrepreneurs who are um, forced to downsizing? How do how should they approach that? Yeah, um, so that that was the paper that I wrote about that got some mixed reactions because some people thought that I was telling people like we need to downsize, and I'm really you know excited about downsizing. I'm not excited about downsizing, but my message was actually um, because I noticed in the U.S. we were talking about it a lot. A lot of big numbers had been announced and in Europe, um, we're just not talking about it. Like there's no mention of it. And part of me was wondering, well, is this because it's not happening? Is this because it's happening and people are afraid to talk about it? If they're afraid to talk about it, why? Um, I do think it's for a number of reasons. I think one is obviously we have government support here that we haven't had, that we don't see in the US, um, which means that companies can hang on to their employees, but at some point, the question is going to be asked, what do I do? Because government support doesn't last indefinitely. Um, at that moment, we could potentially see people downsizing. And I also think there has been some under the radar downsizing today that people haven't spoken about. One, because it's taboo. Um, these are companies that have maybe been promoted as a local champion and you know, now having to say, I let go of my staff and we're having difficulty. They don't want to come out and say it. Maybe their investors don't want them to say it. Um, but also, I think the government hasn't facilitated this because they have really discouraged people or companies letting go of their staff. So what I really wanted to get out there as a message is that one is we should not be ashamed to see companies come forward and talk about the reality. It's just a reality of the current economic situation. And also our press um, should not take advantage of this to bash investors and entrepreneurs that are having difficult situations. And I think we've started to see a little bit of that um, with some of the, the companies that have announced people start saying, well, I told you so, or this wasn't a great company mm -hmm. to begin with. And that's not necessarily the case. Um, so two examples that I really thought were worth mentioning. Now I realize not every entrepreneur has the ability to replicate is Carta CEO. I think he's been hailed as like a champion. He let go of over 150 people in a really honest, open, heartfelt message where he said to his company, your managers fought to keep you. I made the decision to let you go. And I think it, it shows a real responsibility. Mm -hmm. And then another one that I really thought was um, really honorable as well was Monzo, which is a UK based company. They let a lot of people go. They had to furlough a lot of staff, but also their entire management team took a salary cut. And I think saying, look, we're going to take this hit with everybody. It also really sends a very strong message. I think also the difference between Europe and, and the States is the is cultural too, because in the States you can be fired in a second and it's, it's, it's kind of an and the culture, it's in it's in the in in the people, they are used to it. But in France or in Europe in general, you have you have delays that you need to respect and you can fire people um, 
uh, that easy. So maybe this is something that's also impacted the, uh, the fact that startups are not talking about downsizing too. Um, so let's keep going with, uh, we have a lot of questions. Um, so is Station F contributing to centralization of opportunities in Paris? Do you have complaints from other cities in France? Ah, no, I don't think we have any complaints. There was a fear before we opened Station F. We hadn't communicated at all about what we were doing. So I think there was a natural fear just that people didn't know. And there was a fear that we were going to suck all the startups out of all the other startup spaces in Paris. Um, so we actually went out of our way to look for programs that were not already based in Paris and to launch new programs that didn't already exist. And what we saw was that uh, we had 11,000 startups apply for 1,000 spots in our first year. So we could have filled like 11 station Fs, no problem. So I think nobody was really uh, too upset about that. Yeah. So we have another question. Speaking of changes we are seeing due to the, to the, due to the crisis, how would you think the world will be fundamentally different at the other side of this? What are some of the permanent changes that will shape society in the future? You know, I want to I want to think that a lot of these changes that we're seeing today will be long term because I actually think we've seen a lot of um, really beneficial changes. But with every economic crisis, people have short memory and things often go back to normal after two years. So I think we will see some changes in some of the consumer behaviors that we've seen. Mm -hmm. um, I'm worried that some of the real behavior, behavioral changes that we need to see actually won't be as long-term as we might like. Uh, so for example, we've seen obviously the environment in some places has done you know, a lot better and uh, people have started to be more conscious about certain things. I don't know that I believe that these will be long-term unless we actually make a conscious effort and commitment to making them long-term. Um, so uh, we have, Another question from Vincius. Uh, I have been working on projects in three different areas. Do you recommend I submit these three different proposals or do you recommend I choose only one? So people, this is something that we see also in flat six labs. We have like sometimes founders, they have so many ideas and so many projects they are working on and they don't know what to how to apply or in in um, uh, what idea they should apply with so what would you recommend so at station f we like to see somebody dedicated to one idea if we have somebody with too many ideas it looks like they don't know how to focus uh, it looks like they don't know how to prioritize so that's that's really why when we see multiple ideas from one person it tends to just be an overall no um, now, how to choose which idea you should concentrate on, I actually would encourage the person, even though you're probably likely to want to go after the one that's successful or doing the best in terms of numbers, I actually really think you should do the one that you're personally the most attached to and in love with. People forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon. It's painful. It's not at all the fancy headlines all the time. It's just like, you know, it's, it's marathon is really just the best way to describe it. And so you need to be committed. So pick the idea that you can really commit yourself to. I think that's the best advice I could give. Um, so my last question for you um, would be, what are really the giveaways uh, from this whole crisis, from this whole situation? What lessons have you learned from this? Um, I think it's really what's in my letter to my to the Station F community, which is something I probably actually wish for the entire ecosystem. Um, one is this is an opportunity to take advantage of, and we need to hold ourselves to the highest standards possible and not let go of the, the good side effects that we've seen. So people coming together, sharing, um, you know, really making things available to one another, being available for one another. And also really, I think we, we talked about this earlier that if we wanna actually see long-term positive change, we need to, you know, actually commit ourselves to making a long-term positive change. So I think that's really what I've seen. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll see long-term investor behavior change as well. Um, but I think history has shown us that it, 
all with all the behavior in the economic downturn, it tends to last a few years and then go right back. That's great. Thank you so much, Roxanne. And it's been really a pleasure having you with us. Um, so um, I give the uh, I give the word to um, to Sara. Thank you both very 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 much. This was super interesting, and I'm very grateful for your time. I'm very excited to see everyone next week for our sixth webinar series with the Vice President uh, Mina, Mina Department with the World Bank and Flat Six Labs is the uh, Chief Investment Officer Dina Shanufi. I also want to encourage everyone to tune in tomorrow for the Bahrain uh, fourth demo day. Uh, it's going to be the first digital demo day that we have and next week is also the Flat Six Labs Tunis demo day uh, also on Wednesday and um, Thank you all for your time and thank you all for listening and tuning in. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.